Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello and welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco and today I'm speaking with Ryan Pearson. Uh, Ryan has uh, is the proprietor of Ryan Custom Knives. He's a custom knife maker whose uh, passion is now emerging uh, onto the knife scene. And uh, I've I've heard of him around and I've seen him in articles. And then recently, a uh, good friend of the show, Tier One, our friend Justin, sent me one of uh, uh, Ryan Pearson's Pearson Custom Knives the uh, Nitro V Rhino to check out. I was very impressed and I wanted to get him on the show to talk to him about uh, where he is in his knife making, um, uh, I'm not going to say journey, but journey and uh, and find out uh, you know, exactly what inspires him uh, because his knives are beautiful and in hand, uh, they are something magic. Uh, before we get to that, I just want to remind you to uh, go to Facebook and check out the Facebook group. Uh, I have become active there now, and uh, I look forward to uh, engaging with y'all and just continuing the conversation over there on that platform. Also, I'm on Instagram, Knife Junkie, uh, the Knife Junkie on Instagram for uh, pictures and updates. Uh, you know, you know what Instagram is for. And then also, I just want to remind you to subscribe on YouTube if you haven't yet already, because that's where most of the action happens for the Knife Junkie uh, channel. We have our weekly interview show like this one. We have our Wednesday night, uh, our Wednesday supplemental podcast, our Thursday night knives, and our quarterly town halls where you get to talk to your favorite knife makers. Uh, so definitely go over there and subscribe on YouTube. So without further delay, I bring you Ryan Pearson of Pearson Custom Knives. Got a question or comment? Call the Knife Junkies listener line at 724-466-4487. I'm here with Ryan Pearson. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on, sir. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So uh, as I mentioned in this uh, in the introduction, uh, I had been seeing your knives and your name around. Um, and then just by chance, uh, a friend of the show, uh, Justin, sent me one of your knives, the the Rhino in Nitro V. And uh, yeah, you want to check out this custom knife? I'm like, yeah, sure. Of course. Who's going to say no to that? And I was so... Um, shocked and pleased at the knife I got in my hand. Tell me a little bit about who you are and uh, what you do and how you got to uh, this point where you're making these gorgeous knives. Well, I am, at, at this time, I'm still a full-time mechanic. I do this evenings and weekends. Uh, I, where I live in the mountains of North Carolina, the way it all started was hunting and stuff like that, getting into Knives, I've collected knives my whole life, but I think the, the fixed blade thing come in with, with hunting and just wanting a better knife uh, than what was out there on the shelf. So I decided I would try my hand at making some, and the first ones wasn't worth throwing in the trash, but the way it goes. Well, so uh, what? why make knives? Why not just... Uh, do what the rest of us uh, knife collectors do and just endlessly search online for the perfect knife. I have always been hands-on with everything I do, um, no matter what it is, whether it's carpentry work or whatever. I'm one of those people that just like to do everything themselves. And uh, like I said, the passion for knives is deep. Oh, believe me, sir. I understand the passion for knives is deep. I get that. So what, what, okay. So you're a person who builds stuff. You work with your hands a lot. You repair stuff. What was it like as a knife nut, as a knife collector? What was it like the first time you put your hands to work and you actually produced a knife and not just fix something? It was very satisfying. What, even though you know the knives were not much, uh, I still have them just as something to look back on. Uh, but it's very satisfying taking something from nothing and, and turning it into something. I mean, they're still useful. They're still sharp. You know, they'll still cut. They just ain't the prettiest things in the world. But mm. I, I really enjoy building knives. 
Well, so I've heard this a bit where people uh, like yourself, knife makers who um, have a hunting background, have said that they've been dissatisfied with everything that they've come across um, when it comes to hunting. And so that was an inspiration, uh, like you just mentioned, to, to start making knives. What was it about the hunting knives that were available? What was it about the hunting knives that you had that was so unsatisfactory that you that you went to start making your own? I think it was the steel. Um, the mm. biggest thing is not holding an edge. Uh, you know, you, you skin one, one animal and, and they're dull. So that was a little bit aggravating. The, that was, that was my biggest goal, I think. And still is uh, look to me are secondary to performance. I want the knife to last forever, hold a good edge. And, uh, you know, it's something you can hand down to your kids or mm -hmm. their kids. They should be around for a long time. So you say that uh, that design and looks are secondary. Uh, I, I don't believe you 100% when I when I look at the Rhino because it's a very uh, good looking knife. You know what I mean? And, and the one that I had in hand, um, you know, you won me over with carbon fiber. I'm not generally a carbon fiber kind of guy but you had uh, two different kinds of carbon fiber on the handle, sort of a bolstered look. And then I think maybe the pins were also a third type of carbon fiber. And then uh, the recurve blade, the harpoon swedge, uh, that beautiful sort of thumb area uh, swelled to, to sit your, and then the finish, it, it, it's actually, a, a, it seems like a lot of attention was paid to the looks of it. Um, but, you mentioned steel. The steel was unsatisfactory in these in these other knives, but was it also the blade design? Because that rhino looks like it might be able to skin an animal pretty well. It, it definitely would. Um, yeah, I think that uh, there's a big market for hunting knives and stuff like that that people don't look at something like a recurve with a big belly on it as a hunting knife, but if they actually used it, they realize that it, it's very well, you know, for, for that kind of use. But the, the rhino was kind of my whole life. I've been called rhino. That's been my nickname since I was little. So I kind of had to do a knife um, called rhino and I'm short and stocky. So I wanted the knife to be short and stocky. I also make a, a version of that knife. It's the same knife. It's just a bigger version. A lot of my knives are like that. I'll make what I call the EDC version, and mm -hmm. then I make the larger version of them. Um, some people, I, I sell more of the EDC size knives. Uh, you know, just most. It's more practical for most people to carry and use. And um, the the larger ones, they they're not as popular. But I prefer. You know, like the five inch rhino stuff like that. The new, um, the new knife that I just came out with, the Lynx. Um, it's designed kind of as a hunting knife. You know, I do all knife, whatever you want to do with. So, do you have the Lynx with you by chance? I, yeah, I do. Okay, let's see it. And and any other knife you have, I think actually, while Jim was just scrolling on your Instagram page, there was a full size rhino kind of in the center of the page with a dagger featured with a dagger. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I love the way that looks even better blown up. I got to say, I do like the dag. I, I do like the small version that I held, but the bigger one looks even better. Ooh, what do we have here? This is the links. Um, it's a, it's a drop point. Uh, it has jumping right here for your thumb. You also have jumping out at the end of the blade. I don't know if you can see that mm -hmm. or not. Uh, move it towards. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. We can see that. So, you can for finer work and stuff like that you can get out towards the end of the blade this is a an order most of my knives are done to order mm -hmm. i i don't do a whole lot i do build some extra stuff but most of it's done somebody sees a knife like now when a new knife comes out of course it's going to be available when it comes out but from then on it's mostly by order what i do and they can, they can take it as far as they want it. Whatever finish they want, whatever handle material they want, liner color, pins, you know, it's the sky's the limit really when it comes to designing your own knife. 
Okay, so let me ask you, the, the knife you just held up, the lynx, you called it, uh, so that looks like a full flat ground, right? Fully flat ground knife. Um, and then the rhino, for instance, the only one I've experienced with, uh, is a um, is a hollow ground knife. How do you de decide on the geometry of the knife? How do you decide how you're going to grind a knife uh, depending on the purpose and the design? It it really depends. So really this links can be hollow ground. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the rhino with the recurve, I went more for the hollow grind just because of the more dramatic lines uh, that you get with the hollow grind. You know, it, the rhino is more, and you know, I say looks is second, which they are, but the rhino is, I, I poured everything into it with the hollow ground and the harpoon and yeah. the different finishes and stuff. You know, it's just a, it's probably one of my favorite knives, the rhino is. So how important is ergonomics to you when you're working up the design of a knife? It's very important. Um, you know, you I want to, whoever buys the knife, I want to be able to use the knife. That's a big thing with hunting and stuff like that is after a while with not other knives off the shelf, your hands are going to start locking up and cramping and hurting and, and it's very aggravating. So um, I like the Coke, what I call a Coke bottle shape handles. Um, they're very comfortable. They, they fit your hands good. Um, I think that ergos is everything when it comes to handle work. So you're talking about Coke bottle. It swells out in the center for your palm and right. kind of, and kind of, yeah, I think that's so pleasing to hold. The the front and then the swell, and then you got the big back, what I call the butt of the knife. Um, keep your hand from slipping back and stuff like that. So. All right. Well, I want to back up. So you said that you've been a lifelong knife collector. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about your knife collection, the kind of things you collect. And uh, I want to see how it inspires uh, what, what your designs look like today. Okay, so when it started out, um, I think the first knife, just like everybody, was, you know, a little small Swiss Army knife. Um, me and my cousins, uh, my dad's always been a knife collector. Uh, we would trade around and stuff like that. And I think that a lot of my influences started out with, like, the yellow case. Um, I, I always loved the Trapper, three-bladed. Mm -hmm. That's always been a favorite. It's evolved over the years, just like everybody. I have a lot of spider co and bench made and some CRK knives. Um, it, it's, it's different from what it used to be, but I still have a lot of the older stuff. Uh, collected knives, collected Zippos, uh, a little bit of everything. But I like traditional. My, my passion is traditional. I love like Bob Loveless, mm -hmm. uh, that he done. I love his stuff. That's what I would, I strive to be there one day doing that type of work. Um, right now, the EDC thing is so big that, you know, you kind of take it where, where it goes. Um, with the EDC knives, the community's huge and I've had great support with them. So that's kind of where, I've drove my businesses to the smaller side stuff that mm -hmm. you, it's a fixed blade. Yeah. But you know, if you stick with a smaller fixed blade, you can scout carry it and stuff and EDC it. Yeah. Drop it in your pocket. Uh, as we record this uh, knife legend, Tony Bowes uh, has, he just passed away in the past a couple of days here. And uh, um, I've seen a lot of an outpouring of, uh, of um, you know sympathy and and such and and just you know uh, reflection on on his passing. Uh, talk about a traditional knife guy. I mean, he was a uh, you know a, a veritable god of the modern slip joints uh, and and uh, you know creator of a bunch of patterns, uh, Lanny's clip and that kind of thing. So traditional. You're a, you're a fixed blade man right now, a fixed blade knife maker right now. If you were to go into folders. Is that where you see yourself going in that sort of uh, slip joint direction? Absolutely. That's that's the next step. Um, 
I'm going to next year, 2021, there's big plans coming. Uh, slip joints are in the near future. Uh, well, I, uh, that, I that has me thrilled because I'm a slip joint lover <laughs> right now. And uh, I think it's really great when uh, excellent custom knife makers uh, bend their energy towards slip joints. There are a lot of great custom knives out there, but not so many people making uh, slip joints. So it's kind of cool to see when someone has that passion. Yeah. I, I, I love slip joints. So what? Uh, so so the case, the yellow Del Rin case. Uh, I have one of those. What? Who? What about your the inspirations for your fixed blades? What kind of? Uh, you mentioned Loveless. I don't have any Bob Loveless knives, unfortunately. But yeah, um, yeah. what other? What other designers? Uh, uh, any mentors along the way that helped you uh, um, actually learn the craft? No, I I have never. Uh, met another knife maker uh honestly a lot of what i learned started out on youtube um oh yes it's, it's crazy but there's so much information out there you can learn to do just about anything and every little bit you pick up is a new trick here and a new trick there and uh, you know it I, there was a knife i wish I think it you um, back years ago when the uh, Outdoor Edge came out with the swing blades, the blade would flip. And you had like the gut hook thing on one side. Oh, oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's like a. Yeah. Okay. Back then, you know, I think that knife alone was like 150 bucks. Wow. Well, I was into twenty, thirty dollar case knives and stuff like that. So 150 bucks was a lot of money for a knife. Yeah. That is the knife that made me start making knives. Honestly, that, that knife, I said, you know, I think I can build it. So that that's where it all started. That is the knife that drove me. I actually have one of those knives now and it's junk, but uh, it is what it is. <laughs> that's, that's the one that got me started. So you're, a, you, you were a mechanic at the time as well, right? And yeah. you have these knives you have this uh, job where every day you're going in and you're working with your hands, working with machines, working with metal, a lot of metal, I would imagine. Is it, is it car mechanics? Automobile? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so working with a lot of that machinery, um, how did you make that jump? How did you do? Okay. You, well, you, you told me you were inspired, but you still have to buy all the machines and kit yourself out. How does that work? Um, in the beginning, I, a lot of it was hand files and hand drills and stuff, you know, and just gradually worked my way up to getting the equipment. Um, I'm still adding new equipment all the time. Um, there's, there's a big thing. My, my grandfather started the garage where I work at. Um, I think it's been 53 years ago. He's still doing it today, 78 years old, still comes into work every day. Uh, that's a lot of inspiration for me is seeing him get out there and go at it at his age. And, and he built it from nothing. And, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, you know, I haven't took any handouts. I'm going to scrape and claw till I get it where I want it. And, and I'm getting there. Uh, I love everybody that I've met. You know, there's a lot of good people. A lot of people push my name out there. Um, I've made a lot of good friends. I have some people that have bought several knives. Some people bought one knife. They all mean the same thing. Customer service is everything. If you call me at two o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna answer my phone and and talk. I I think that come from my grandfather. The you know he's old school. He's hardcore as they come. And, they, uh, he, he taught me to, I mean, more or less just like you were told when you were little, treat everybody the way you want to be treated. So, yeah. Yeah. But also remember you have a business and you have to, you have to put that first. And so imagine what you're going to be like in 53 years or take a knock off three years. Cause you've been making knives for a while, I guess. Imagine what you're going to be like after having done knives for 53 years, the kind of knowledge you have, um, you know, and then uh, you're thinking of your grandfather bumping around the same shop, 
you know, he could probably navigate that place, find any tool with his eyes closed. Oh, yeah. And uh, so that's going to be you someday in your own shop. How do you how do you want to see your company uh, evolve? Do you want to always be uh, the sole proprietor and the one one person making your works of art? Do you want to expand? How do you want to handle your the future of your company? I think, honestly, I would like to keep it like it is. Um, I I design them, I build them, I do it all. I know that that makes it a a very limited amount that I can put out. Um, my dad is a big help. He'll come and, and help me, you know, when he has time, like if there's cutting handle material up or whatever it may be there, he'll come and help. So I think that it'll always be me building the knives. There may be help in other places, you know, but I think I will always be the one building the knife. So, so you'll get you'll get uh, some cousin you don't like to do the Kydex work and that kind of stuff. That's not so fun, right? <laughs> so, excuse me. I, I find uh, so you come up in a uh, you came up in a family environment, family work environment, working in a in a garage, and uh, we've spoken to a lot of people on this show who have uh, grown up that way and or have created that for their own families and uh you know so their knife companies are family businesses and i i think that that's like um well to me that's really inspirational it's also a kind of a very american thing i know i know that you'll see that in other countries too but to me it's a very um, american trait people family working together at the same um, enterprise um, so i don't know i, I kind of find inspiration in that i i do too i i I think family's everything, and uh, my son, you know, he, he's nine years old, and he likes knives, so hopefully uh, he gets older, he'll, maybe he'll take it up with me, and he, he may run it one day when I'm not able to, but we'll see how that goes. I, so, I hope so, because, you know, but you got to have that passion. Yeah. If passion's not there, it ain't going to work, you know, I, when I started out, I, I never thought that I would sell a knife. Like it, it was, I was doing it for me, for myself. And it just gradually, I think Instagram um, is for makers. You can't go wrong putting your work out there and, and letting people see it. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing. That's what drove my work out there. Uh, because like I said, I don't, I don't do a website, which I have somebody working on a website, uh, mm -hmm. but right now everything I've done is, is Instagram. I think this year I have since January the 1st, I think I've made 160 knives this mm. year, you know, for one person, that's a lot, especially we still work full-time job. Right. So Ryan, let's take a look at some of the knives. You you said you have some in front of you. Um, and tell me what tell me what what's that? I have a new knife. That's um, uh, I call it the Micro Chief. I, the Chief is a knife that I've been building for a while. Uh, I make the Little Chief, and then I make the Normal Chief. Like I said, I make different sizes. A friend of mine who has several of my knives, he comes to me and. He's wanting to have a knife made for his dad, but he wanted something that he could make a leather pocket slip, put an ultra clip on it, clip it in his pocket, and he'd have a small knife. This is the smallest knife that I've ever made. Let me see if I can get it in the camera. Um, it's five and a quarter inches overall, two inch blade. It's just a three finger handle. It's it's very small. It's stone washed. Um, I, I have a certain way that I do my stone washing and stuff on my knives. I call it a marble wash, but. Uh, you call it the what? A marble wash. Marble uh, wash. Kind of gets that marble look to it. It's hard to see on the camera. Um, if I can pick it up here, maybe I'm up. That is a little beauty. I mean, to me, that's the quintessential little drop in your pocket knife. Oh, that's nice. You have the jimping and so um, what's this what's this model called you this is the micro chief 
micro chief. Okay. So what is the regular chief? You have that on you or close I by? I don't have one here. Um, okay. the, the normal chief is, I, I think it's like eight, a little over eight inches overall. Um, then the little chief is seven inches overall. I don't have one of those either. Uh, I have some, I, my most popular knife that I sell is probably the Titan. Um, it's this knife right here. That's, um, oh, um, yeah. Um, it has the forward finger chill. Um, Justin from Tier 1 has one of these in carbon fiber. This one's in satin finished with removable scales, and it's got box elder burl on the, on the handles. Um, so that blade uh, uh, profile is striking to me, especially with the, uh, it's kind of stepped from the uh, handle finger choil to the blade finger choil to the edge. And mm -hmm. it really gives you a lot of knuckle clearance and a lot of uh, finger clearance on that. Uh, yeah. I could see how a hunter would really, would really want that. Not that I've ever dressed out game, but it seems, it seems like you would want that sort of full belly uh, with that clearance there. Yeah, you get a lot of a lot of control when you choke up on it. You know, you still you got handle behind, but you still have a full handle in front that you can grip it. But uh, this this knife has been very popular. This this is like a four inch blade on the Titan, um, so it's still not a great big knife. Uh, most of my knives are between three to five inches the blade length is 90 percent of my knives i make some bigger knives but it's it's pretty rare that most people want smaller stuff right so uh you set out to solve some problems with the hunting knives that were out there at the time when you started making knives did you solve the problem or have you just made more problems for yourself um i think that i've made it better i think that you know i there'll always be room to grow and, and, and change things. Like I use, when I come up with a new knife it, and I say that it's for skinning an animal, I use it. And, uh, I, I wish I had my EDC tool here. Um, I actually loaned it to somebody. I call it the EDC skinner cause it's, it's small. It's like a little under a three inch blade. But, um, last year, I, when I started working with Nitro V, before I even put any knives out, I uh, I built that knife, heat treated it, and used it all deer season on five deer and still razor sharp, you know, shave your arm. So I was very happy with the Nitro V. I, I built, I mean, I used everything, S90V, Elmite. So I, I used just about any steel that you can think of. But, um I've been happy with Nitro V. It's kind of a mid-range steel, but you can pull a lot of performance out of it if you if you know what you're doing with it. So do you do all your own heat treating? Because you work with some pretty complicated steels, it sounds like. I, I do. I do all my own heat treat. Okay. And and then do you find – so you mentioned LMAX, uh, Nitro V. I know you make 20CV and S90V. Mm -hmm. Are those – it, I'm under the impression that those are extremely difficult steels to work with. Is that true? Or I, I, I don't think so. I, you know, I'm, they're definitely a little harder to grind and, and stuff like that. Um, as far as the heat treat goes, they're, there's not, they're not that much different. I mean, you know, I cryo everything. Everything gets cryoed. Uh, I have an even heat kiln that'll do it all i mean you set it and and it pretty much does it for you so you just put it in there take it out when it's time and and do your cryo cycles and temper cycles um there's a lot that that goes into it that people don't see as far as researching and knowing knowing temperatures and stuff like that i have a book that i've made myself and mm. you know with my own recipes and uh They've come out. I've, I've been very happy with, with it. it. It's taken some time. I used to only work with carbon steel. You know, like everybody, that's how you right. get started. It's simple to heat treat and stuff, but there's just not a big market for, for carbon steel knives anymore. So how do you incorporate 
uh, what you hear back. You know, I'm thinking of the heat treat. Do you, um, do you tweak your heat treat recipe uh, uh, from uh, performance feedback you might get from clients? I do. Yeah. Um, I'll, I, I, you know, like I'll do a lot of research and, and kind of get that, that baseline that everybody, most people heat treat with. And, and then I try to take it, take that to the next level. Um, the, uh, I actually have a friend of mine who I've done a 10 V knife for, uh, now that's a tough steel to work with, uh, but I, uh, he, he let me know the other day, a friend of his got a, uh, Rockwell tester and it, it tested just a little over 64 wow. stuff. Wow. Yeah. That I've, I've heard that that is pretty, pretty intense. So what, what uh, Jim just had up on screen was the knives illustrated art article. Uh, when did that come out and how, how did that, uh, Hey, did that give you a boost? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I've had, I've sold several knives, uh, that people told me they seen it. Uh, a lot, the ones that I have are people that's not on Instagram or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, they seen it in a book and sent me an email. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Ben blade banker, oh, yeah. um, he, knives, uh, he, he got in touch with me, said that, you know, they had seen his collection him, where he had made his videos and stuff about them. And they wanted him to do a write up on them. Want to know if it was OK with me. I said, of course, it's OK with me. <laughs> There's so, uh he done it. He wrote it all up. Uh, I'm very thankful for that. I appreciate that that he done that. I know he spent a lot of time doing it. And it was um, September and October's issue for this year. A few pages inside the magazine. I, I was I was very surprised with that. Yeah, you got a cover. That's pretty awesome and a nice spread inside. <clears throat> so that goes, you know, that's a nice bit of marketing. Um, you have podcasts like this. You have Instagram, uh, Facebook, and other places. But um, what what are you discovering about the business of knives? that maybe differs from um, the automobile uh, mechanic business. Uh, how, how, what's your approach? How is it different? And what are you learning about the knife business? So where I'm from, I'm in a, I'm from a small town. So there's not, you know, around here, I mean, I would say there's five, five other garages. So, you know, in the automotive field, people's going to take their car to one of those five. Uh, in the knife making, there's thousands and thousands of knife makers out there. So somehow you got to be different uh, from what everybody else is doing. And that's hard to do because there's only so many ways that you can make a knife. You can, you can change this, you can change that, but there's still only so many ways that a knife can be made. Uh, so being different in that aspect is, is pretty tough. I think it comes down to caring about your heat treat, making sure that that performance is there, that that knife's going to last them for a long time. Um, not pricing yourself out of work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's too high. You know, most people don't want to pay a bunch of money to try it out. Once they get a knife, then they may come back and say, hey, I want to build this and this because the sky's the limit on what you can spend, you know, material-wise and stuff like that. But uh, I think that it's hard to be different with so many, so many makers out there. And there's a lot of good makers out mm -hmm. there that making some incredible stuff. It's just uh, being consistent, uh, being friends with them. I think, uh, you know, being not talking back and forth with them, not thanking them, uh, tell them how, I, you know, I'm grateful for their business, their support. Uh, being personable, I think is a big part of it. And interacting with them, not just selling them, selling, them, but actually having a relationship with you after the knife is after you've bought the knife, before you've bought the knife, during building the knife, you know, just being personable about it. Uh, I I would also wager uh, that something you forgot is is looks. I know you don't really focus on looks, uh, that is of the knife, but I mean you have a very graceful 
and simple uh, design language. It's very, um, you know, it's sort of perfectly stated and not overdone. And uh, I think that uh, you could have all the all the great um, customer service you could muster, and you could do the best heat treat and have the best geometry. But if you're making, you know, ugly knives or just knives that look like they might not feel good in hand, people are going to walk to the next table. And you look at your knives, they look very functional, but they also look beautiful and they look comfortable. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're, you're definitely right. Yeah, they, they got to have looks. Um, one thing I'm kind of transitioning away from is G10. Um, I feel like G10 is played out. Uh, I've, I've worked with a lot of G10 and I'm just, I've kind of got burnt out on it. Uh, so I kind of wanting to take it to the next next area um, with like Burl Woods, like this knife here. Um, it has oh, and yeah. uh, so many pretty woods out there. Uh, this is one of my favorite knives to make. I don't get to make them a whole lot because it's it's just not a EDC size knife. But the uh, burls and carbon fibers uh stuff like that that that's kind of where where i'm taking it now i think the g10 you can you can only see so many solid colors uh so i immediately think of two different knife makers fiddleback forge and bark river knives uh two knife companies uh, that have standard patterns uh that they build um, uh, with, you know, on a rotational basis or whatever, you know, um, so they're not always building the same pattern, but they have this huge selection of kind of unique handles, you know, they'll get some, some sort of crazy burl wood and they'll do a run with this, but they, they'll make a model in, I don't know, tw I'm thinking of Bark River right now, 20 different handle materials. And yeah. to me, that becomes the exciting part. It's kind of the same thing with traditional slip joint knives. Uh, checking out what the handle covers are made of and how they're jigged and all that yeah. and all that kind of. <clears throat> uh, so you mentioned before uh, uh, when you were talking about customer service, you mentioned about uh, kind of being there for the entirety of the experience of the build with a customer. Does that mean that you're literally kind of updating? Look at what I did to your knife today. Here are pictures. What do you think? And, yeah. and, and how does that go for you? Do you ever have people say, oh, a little, take a little bit off the nose or? I, I honestly, no, I, um, I stay in contact with them. I would say once a week, you know, once I, once I start on the knife, uh, right now I'm running about four months out to get a knife done and shipped out. It seemed, you know, I wish it was shorter, but one person, it, it takes some time to get them done. But, uh, I usually about once a week, I'll, you know, message them. It, even if it's not a picture of the knife, I'll just give them kind of a description of where I'm at with it and time frame of when it's going to be done. And, uh, you know, usually when the knife's built, because you can send me a picture. I actually had a guy, uh, he's a good friend of mine, bought a knife a while back. I haven't seen him in a while, but he, he asked me if I would make him a knife. And I said, yeah, you know, and, so then about a week later, he messaged me and he's like, hey, I come up with this design. Do you think you can make it? And I said, mail it to me. You know, I'll build it if that's what you want. So he sent it to me and I'm building it for him now. But, uh, so I, I don't only make my own knives, you know, like the Titan. Uh, it was a it's my design, but I had a guy get in touch with me and uh, he wanted that size knife with a full finger toil. And uh, he wanted something he could put on his backpack when he goes camping and stuff like that. So that's where that knife come from. You know, I may not have a design you like, but if it's if it's something I can come up with, then I'll I'll build it. Oh God, that's interesting because uh, I, I hadn't thought of this uh, for a while. Um, but the whole idea of I, I remember um, I don't know maybe six or seven years ago trying to get a knife maker that I liked to make. A, a my design knife and and there was this uncomfortable back and forth it was kind of like talking to a tattoo artist who's uh who just does their own thing and you come in you're like you know can you can you write delicious on my forearm you know or something and they're like that's not what i do 
So, yeah. so if someone comes to you, I mean, this, this is a, they come to you with a design. Does it have to be something that you resonate with? Or if I came to you and said, make me a four foot long Tanto with giant teeth and spikes and all that, you know, where do you draw the line as a maker? Uh, I think it's between reality and fantasy. I mean, <laughs> There's fantasy knives out there, and then there's uh, knives that are useful. Hey, as long as it's a useful knife, I'll build it. It, it doesn't matter. I, you know, like I said, there's only so many ways a knife can be built, if, unless you get into fantasy stuff, which I've never, I, I haven't made any of that stuff. There's a big market for that stuff, mm, but yeah. uh, I haven't, I haven't built that stuff. I, I, I prefer more traditional. Okay. Well, okay. All that being said, I mean, of course I didn't, wasn't su suggesting you should take the fantasy path. It just doesn't yeah. seem, it doesn't seem like you, but I mean, is it something you encourage, you know, um, uh, because actually having a knife built to your own specs could be a very exciting thing, you know, to do, especially if you have someone like you who's bona fide and has the chops to make it. Uh, I mean, that, that could be a really, is that something you encourage people to come to you with? Yeah, I mean, if, if if they have their own design like him, um, as far as trying to cipher it out from a picture, like I told him, I said, best thing you can do is either do it in a PDF, send it to me, or, or just mail it to me through the mail. And, and, and actually, I'm building it exactly off his specs. He wrote down blade length, what size pins he wanted, how much drop he wanted in the drop point. And, you know, he, he had it down to the T, what he wanted, and and that's why I'm building. It's a I I like the challenge, you know. He has in his mind what that knife needs to be, and and I'm going to meet that challenge. So if tomorrow you were handed, God forbid, the cosmic uh, decision that you could only make one more knife in your career, and it could be your dream build, it could be any knife, any design, any materials, what would that look like? Um, probably. A Bowie knife. I, I love Bowie knives. Um, I would say it'd probably be a 10 inch Bowie knife uh, with Tasmanian blackwood handles and, and a nice stainless guard. It that I love a good, nice Bowie. Yeah. Good answer, man. Good answer. I, I would buy that knife. Uh, you know, it being your last, it would be worth uh, a whole lot more than just a great Bowie. I'm, I too am a huge, huge sucker for a Bowie. And as a matter of fact, well, I, I won't bore you with that until we're done rolling here. But, uh, okay, so uh, from your perspective right here, I know you're not a full-time knife maker yet. I know that uh, you've mentioned, you've indicated that that is where you would like to be someday. So from this part of your trajectory, what, what do you tell people who are behind you? What do you tell people who just now have an inkling to get into what you're doing? Uh, what kind of advice could you pass down? There's a lot of video good videos out there that can teach you about everything you need to know about it uh, i say start out scraps whatever you can find there and work your way up uh, it's you know if you have the passion to do it then then i say get it and do it you know you don't have to have the best equipment um you know my my first grinder i built it i built it myself uh you know there's videos out there how to build a grinder there's you know it there's a lot of information out there. If you want to get into knife making, uh, I say the best way to do it is just to dig in and do it. So uh, how do people find your work? How do, how do people get in touch with you and get your, uh, get your knives? So the, the easiest way to get in touch with me is through Instagram at Pearson custom knives. Um, the second would be probably Facebook at Pearson knives. And then my email, or, or they can call me, you know, they can get in touch with me. Uh, my email is rjppasc at gmail. Uh, so you can get in touch with me there. I have some people, the ones, you know, some people don't have Instagram and stuff like that. So they'll get in touch with me through there. So uh, before I let you go, uh, have you heard back from clients, from customers uh, who've been carrying your knives out in the field? And what, what kind of things are you, are you hearing back from them? everything is positive um i have really really enjoyed hearing back and getting pictures and stuff from them of them using them and 
uh, so far everything has been good you know I've, uh, I have several friends that that use them a lot and then I have several people that are just clients that I've met through this and, and I call them friends I call them my brothers everybody's my brothers uh, in, in the knife community so uh, it, it's nice to hear back and, and know that they're working good and, and doing what they're supposed to do well, uh, the reason I ask you that is because the the one example I had was such a beautiful, um, it was so beautifully made and conceived and just uh, and executed. If I, if I owned it, I can't see myself using it for anything. I would, I would, you know, um, kind of keep it as a safe queen. Uh, whereas I know with some of your other designs and some of your other handles and stuff, it's a little more simple than the tricked out version I had in hand. So it's, it's really uh, cool to hear that you're making knives kind of across the spectrum. I mean, everything from, you know, collectible to um, straight utility. And, and I would, I would emphasize the utility side of things. Um, so I, I think that's pretty impressive. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's if the rhino, if you don't want to use it, just buy two of them, put one of them up and use the other. Yeah, exactly. And get the XL too. Why not? Yeah, might as well. Well, Ryan Pearson of Pearson Custom Knives. Ryan, it's been a pleasure having you on the Knife Junkie podcast and getting to meet you a little bit. Uh, the man behind that beautiful knife I had in my possession for three scant weeks a few years, uh, a few weeks ago. So uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show. And uh, keep us up to date uh, as you move forward. Uh, what else you have going on? I will. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to talking to you some more. All right. Take care, sir. You too. Are you looking for a book about knives or knife collecting, knives and self-defense, or the yearly knife Bible filled with hundreds of pages of information and pictures about your favorite knives? Shop at thenifejunkie.com slash books for your traditional favorites, new books about knives, and the yearly knife Bible. Get your favorite knife book and support the show at thenifejunkie.com slash books. I love when uh, Jim runs that liner. I love all of those books, especially the self-defense books. They look so cool. Anyway, uh, Ryan Pearson, it was really great to get him on the show and to, and to meet him. Like I said, it's not too often that I get custom-built handmade knives in my hands. Uh, hopefully that changes at an ever-quickening pace, you know, uh, as the years go by here. But uh, I had his knife in hand for a few weeks and was just so impressed with it. And uh, I really, really, uh, well, value the opportunity to meet people who who put these things, who, who put their, their heart and soul to make these things that we love. As you can see, Ryan is a rising star, uh, Knives Illustrated, and uh, a, a number of uh, high profile, uh, uh, what do you call it, reviewers on YouTube looking at his stuff. And uh, so I think we're going to hear a lot more from Ryan Pearson as time goes by. Uh, but check him out on, on his Instagram page. That is probably the best place uh, to view his his beautiful stuff. And one quick takeaway, and I, I it's just sort of dawned on me at the very end, but I mean, he very much emphasized the utilitarian nature, the utility of the knives he makes, but but really he can he can cover all bases from absolutely beautiful safe queen style knives to uh, things you're not afraid to bang around with and get bloody uh, in the field while you uh, field dress uh, an animal. Me, the hunter. I love talking about field dressing animals. Anyway, that uh, just about does it for this episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I also want to remind you to uh, check out the Facebook group, Instagram, and subscribe on YouTube so you find out uh, every time uh, one of these podcasts drops. All right. Well, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, saying have a great night and don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.